Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today we're going to be featuring, at least at first, Conrad QD here in the Swedish Tier 10 destroyer, the Halland. The Halland is a funny ship, and I mean funny peculiar, not funny ha-ha, for a couple of reasons. First, it's not really considered a gunboat destroyer, and yet its guns are pretty good, although it does only have four of them, and the range is bad, only 10.4 kilometers. The lack of gun range can, however, sometimes work to your advantage, because if you are forced into a gunfight with a ship that's within 10.4 kilometers and you kill it, if there are no other ships within 10.4 kilometers, you immediately go undetected, which is useful because the Halland does not have a smokescreen. The gun turrets have a very fast traverse, unlike previous destroyers in this line, and the guns have a very, very good rate of fire which means that the Halland's damage per minute is actually pretty good. And yet she's still not really a gunboat, because while she can dish the damage out, she can't really take it. The Halland's health pool is on the mediocre side, although this is offset by the fact that she does have access to a heal. So you don't really want to be putting the Halland into a gunfight unless you know you have the advantage. And if you find yourself in a gunfight without the advantage, the high damage per minute means that the Halland will be able to dish out a lot of hurt, but you're probably going to lose a lot of health in the process as well. So if it's not really a gunboat, does that make it a torpedo destroyer? Well, kind of yes, but also kind of no. Because while the Halland does have incredibly fast torpedoes with a very, very short reload, the individual alpha damage is kind of bad. They only do 10,700 damage maximum. Which doesn't sound too bad until you compare them against other torpedoes launched by tier 10 destroyers, like for example the Japanese Shimakaze that has access to three different types of torpedoes, the worst of which do twice as much damage as the Halland's torpedoes, and they fire more of them. Then you have other peculiarities associated with the Halland, aside from the fact that it doesn't have a smoke screen, although it does have the heal to compensate, but the guns, while the DPM is good, the rear turret obviously cannot fire straight ahead, but neither can the front turret, because those hedgehog anti-submarine launchers are in the way and block the line of fire directly ahead. But we'll talk about that more when we come to cover the anti-submarine warfare capabilities of the Halland, because there are two submarines on each team in this battle, and while on paper, the Halland's anti-submarine warfare capabilities should be pretty fearsome, in reality they're actually kind of shit. For now, however, things are about to get interesting. He's attempting to flip cap circle Alpha, and he is sharing this cap circle with another destroyer, and it's the Shimakaze right there. Here is where things take a turn for the bizarre. He needs to sink the Shimakaze as quickly as humanly possible to avoid getting shot up by the Shimakaze's teammates, and he manages to torpedo him, and the Shimakaze manages to miss at a range of less than two kilometers with all 15 of its torpedoes. However, it was that first gunshot that he took against the Shimakaze that's going to screw him here, because that means his detection range bloomed to the maximum range of his guns, in this case 10.5 kilometers, which means that the Smolensk continued to see him and basically ripped him a new arsehole. So, he's got the first blood award, he's taking care of the Shimakaze, that's obviously an important kill, but despite the fact that he has a heal, it's cost him three quarters of his health. So from here on in, he is definitely not a gunboat, and he's going to be relying on his torpedoes. Fortunately, the pretty bad alpha damage notwithstanding, the torpedoes are pretty good. She can put 10 of them in the water at the same time. They have an insanely fast speed of 86 knots, and that's the base speed before you take into account any captain skills that make them go even faster. The base reload is only 100 seconds, and again, that's without taking into consideration any captain skills that improve the reload, and they have a range of 15 kilometers, so the torpedoes are very, very good. They just don't do a huge amount of damage. At the moment, with the Shimakaze disposed of, and uh, the Smolensk not really looking like he wants to come out from behind the island over there, uh, Conrad is flipping this central cap unopposed. Let's talk about those anti-submarine warfare capabilities. 
because each team does have two submarines in play, and unless I'm extremely mistaken, those are submarine launch torpedoes cutting through this cap circle right now, and yes, I can see sonar pings as well. So Conrad's firing the Hedgehog launcher here. And unless I'm very much mistaken, the Hamlet is the only ship in the game that actually has a forward firing Hedgehog launcher. And despite the fact that you can see depth charges going off, which means that the the Hedgehog here in World of Warships is not actually a Hedgehog launcher, it's just a forward firing depth charge launcher because depth charges explode when they reach a certain depth, that's why they're called depth charges. The bombs fired by the Hedgehog didn't explode unless they actually hit something, but they had a vastly better chance of hitting something than any depth charge pattern. It's one of the reasons why Despite the fact that they had a potentially war-winning, or at least Battle of the Atlantic winning weapon available as early as late 1942, early 1943, the crews didn't really trust them, because you could see the depth charges going off. Even though 98% of the time the depth charges weren't actually going to hit anything, you could see the depth charges going off. You knew that you were doing something. When you launched the hedgehogs, nothing would happen until they actually hit something which didn't inspire the same level of confidence in the destroyer and corvette escort crews. I'm actually reading a book at the moment by my friend Dave Lister. It's called Defeating the Panzerstuka Menace, which is what the Blitzkrieg was referred to until the word Blitzkrieg entered common usage, um, and the development of spigot weapons like the Hedgehog Launcher. I'll put a link in the video description. It's available on Amazon. It's a very good book. But there are numerous problems with the Hallens Hedgehog Launcher, because, well, one, it's not actually a Hedgehog Launcher, because it's clearly firing depth charges. And two, it blocks the line of fire of the forward gun turrets, because when you are attacking a submarine, you catch a submarine on the surface, you charge it down, you fire at it with your guns, which you can't do in the Halland if a submarine's in front of you, because the anti-submarine warfare weapons are in the way. So you can't attack the submarine with your guns without turning away from it. And if you turn away from it, you're not going to hit it with the anti-submarine weapons. Oh, he's managed to get the one torpedo hit. Oh, and it has caused a flood. Although, yeah, the kill was taken by somebody else. But that doesn't matter. The important thing is, they've equalised the kills. Two kills per team. Although they are still behind on points because the enemy team have the other two cap circles. This one over here is the only one that the team have taken. And, well, that was basically done by Conrad. While he's lining up for a torpedo attack on the Amato over there, let's just talk a little bit more about these anti-submarine weapons. Because while depth charges were very effective at driving submarines away, they were comically ineffective at actually killing submarines. Some estimates actually put the chance of scoring a hit on a submarine with a depth charge as low as 2%. Of course, the advantage of depth charges were that you didn't actually need to score a direct hit. If you dropped a pattern of depth charges and they exploded above a submarine, the pressure waves and the shock waves could actually force the submarine down to below crush depth, as well as weakening the hull. And that would be enough, in some cases, to score a kill. Likewise, if the depth charges exploded below the submarine, the pressure waves would force the submarine to the surface, where it was basically defenseless and you could finish it off with your guns. However, along with the shocking inaccuracy, the biggest downside of using depth charges were that you would lose contact with the submarine when you were conducting a depth charge attack. Because for obvious safety reasons, it was a very bad idea to be sailing over the top of your own exploding depth charges, which is why most warships equipped with depth charges had them fitted at the rear, or in some cases on the sides of the ship. Oh, hang on, we'll come back to this in a moment. Conrad's been hydroed. It's not the grosser curve first, he's too far away. I think the Smolensk is pushing up. Oh, that's not good. That's not good at all. Although he is racking up the damage on the Yamato, he's got a double flood there. Which may end up being enough to sink him. He's managed to break the Hydro Lock. And, yep, it was the Smolensk. He knew where he was. He's come out. He's close enough to see him. Although Conrad was making Billy Big Steps in the opposite direction. He's gotten out of surface detection range. And the Smolensk has immediately smoked up. So, yeah, he's gotten away with it. Although that was awfully close. Some torpedoes out against the Smolensk. It looks like the Yamato is about to go down. Anyway, back to the advantages and disadvantages of hedgehogs and depth charge launchers. So, depth chargers. 
very low chance of actually hitting anything. And in order to conduct a depth charge attack, you would have to sail over the top of the submarine, and right before you did that, you would lose sonar contact, which would give the submarine a chance to evade. Is he going to get... yet? Yeah, uh, just the one torpedo hit on the Smolensk. That's a shame. Hedgehogs, on the other hand, because they launched ahead, and they wouldn't explode unless they actually hit anything, you could maintain your sonar contact with the target all the way through the engagement. And unlike with depth charges, where the explosions of the charges would also mess your hydrophones up, making it very difficult to determine whether or not you had actually hit anything, you wouldn't hear anything with a hedgehog attack unless you had hit something, and one hit was all it was ever going to take to knock a submarine out. So having these forward-firing weapons, which would saturate the target area with these bombs, and would allow you to maintain a sonar contact with a submarine all the way through the engagement made the Hedgehog vastly more effective than depth charges at killing submarines. In fact, even conservative estimates place the likelihood of a kill at 40%. Although I think the likelihood of a kill here is about 100% because there's no way Conrad's getting away with this one. Yeah, the Smolensk finally got him. And the team have just lost their Yamato as well, but they're about to get a consolation prize. There's the It's Just a Flesh Wound award. Uh, Conrad wasn't even really aiming his torpedoes at the Grosser Kerr first, but he got him anyway. It's not much of a consolation prize, though, because the enemy team have two of the three caps, although Conrad's team are flipping the third. They're one kill ahead. They've just had their capture process reset. The enemy team now firmly control all three of the cap circles. And, yeah, I mean, they're 300 points up. They're more than 300 points up. In fact, they were 400 points up until Conrad sank the Grosser Kerr first. Yeah, not looking good. Although, the U-2501 has managed to sink the enemy Balao, a sub-on-sub -sub torpedo kill, which was so unlikely that I think it only actually ever happened once, or at least once confirmed in World War II. It looks like they're going to get this Worcester, though. Oh, and the other U-2501 managed to nail the enemy Hindenburg. This Worcester is definitely going down. He doesn't know whether he wants to go forward and get in cover behind the island or back up and continue to get shot at. He eventually decided to move forward, but he wasted far too much time at that point, so he's dead too. So, I mean, I know World of Warships isn't a simulator. It's an arcade game with historical pretensions, but submarines killing submarines? Hedgehog launchers being as ineffective as death charges? In fact less effective than depth charges, because at least if you're firing depth charges, you can use your guns on the submarine as you're running it down. You can't do that with a Hallen because the depth charge launcher blocks the line of fire of the gun. Anyway, the team are rallying. Let's see what happens with the Thunderer here. So he's charging into the Smolensk, and it looks like he's managed to avoid all of the Smolensk's torpedoes. That's good, although the Vermont over there has nailed the Schlieffen, so yeah. I mean, the enemy team is still a good 400 points ahead. Unfortunately, while the Thunderer did manage to turn in order to avoid the Smolensk's torpedoes, and he has a beautiful firing angle on the Vermont over there, did you see the sonar ping? Yeah. His turning out like that has made him a sit and duck for all of those. And he sees them just a fraction of a second too late. Although, honestly, I don't think he was ever going to be able to avoid them. The shots in the air from the Salem do take the Vermont out, but the shots in the air from the Vermont take out the Thunderer. Although, to be fair, if that hadn't happened, the torpedoes from the other side of the Smolensk, who turned around in the smokescreen to get them away, would have finished in two. Now, the enemy team are nearly 400 points ahead, but there's six and a half minutes of this battle left, and they are down a kill. They no longer completely control two of the three caps. So this isn't really a case of the enemy team trying to win harder. They do actually need more kills to guarantee the win. The Minotaur uses his radar and he does catch the U-2501 on the surface, but he obviously instantly crash dives. Although he has very, very limited battery power left, so he's going to be forced to surface soon. The Montana tries to pick him off with his airstrike depth charges. And it's here where we have, well, You'd think that the Montana was an easy target for the Halland, and he is. Except the Halland somehow manages to screw it up. 
by repeatedly running himself aground in his haste to get the correct torpedo firing angle. So the Montana's got him if he just continues turning to the right. So of course the Montana starts turning to the left in order to ensure that he eats every single one of the Hallands torpedoes. <laughs> Yes. Yes, really. So now the enemy team are 400 points ahead again. They still have two of the caps and they're one kill up. Both teams need kills to win with the time remaining. The Hallen gets caught out reversing back around the island and taken out by the Salem. The Minotaur over there has dodged all of the U-2501's torpedoes. He's caught him at periscope depth and he's pouring hell into him with his six inch guns and finishes him off. And that just leaves the enemy grosser Kerr first, who when we pan the camera angle over, there he is, he's just been detected by the U-2501 on the surface, and is about to earn the distinction of being the only battleship in recorded history to go down after being rammed by a submarine. <laughs> Yeah, I know technically he died to the fire set by the torpedoes fired by the submarine, but my version sounds cooler. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what that battle was, but it was something. So, yeah, this is the point where I'm, I'm just going to leave it up to all of you to figure out what the hell it was that you just watched. Bid you all a good day. Hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.